Hello, this is Steve Kenton with Washington Building Congress, and welcome to the COVID-19 Vaccine Current Developments and Best Practices webinar. Wanted to welcome everybody and just briefly wanted to thank Larry Prozen, who is with Cozen O'Connor, and he put this program together and currently is chairing our program and education committee. So thank you to Larry and to Cozen O'Connor. Wanted to just uh, introduce our two speakers and we'll turn it right over to them and get started with the presentation. We have uh, Jeremy Glenn and Mike Schmidt, um, attorneys with Cozen O'Connor, who will be doing the presentation today. So thank you for joining us and let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, Steve. And uh, we are really thrilled to be able to speak with uh, all of you at the WBC today. Appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I always wonder to myself why we need a slide like this with our faces on it when we are right here live uh, over Zoom and you can actually see us anyway. Um, but in any case, uh, we are right in the middle of a tremendous period of time when it comes to vaccines. A lot has happened. Uh, in the past several months. There are a lot of decisions that people need to be making, organizations need to be making right now. And there is a lot that is expected uh, to be taking place in the next few days, the next few weeks. And we are gonna take some time today to talk to you about all of that. Um, Jeremy Glenn uh, is my partner here at Cozen O'Connor. He is a shareholder here in our la uh, labor and employment department, as well as the office managing partner in our Chicago office. I am, as you can see, Mike Schmidt, uh, the vice chair of our labor and employment department, and I am resident here in New York. Cozen O'Connor, uh, the firm that we are with, is a full service law firm of about 775 lawyers around the country. In terms of our labor and employment department, we are 85 labor and employment lawyers, primarily representing management and the management side of issues, whether it is litigation and arbitration or counseling and advice or union related issues. And as you would expect, we have been spending a lot of time on these issues and all things COVID-19 related uh, in the past year and a half. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about uh, how we got where we are, then a little bit about what we're expecting in the near future. So let's start right there with uh, how did we get here on October 14th, 2021, from mask mandates and testing to mandatory vaccines. I'm gonna turn it over to Jeremy to start us off with some history and context, first with mask mandates. Mike, thanks, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to join you from Chicago, where I will give you a brief lay of the land report. In the downtown Chicago area, we still haven't seen a huge return to the office space. Building occupancy is probably hovering in the 30 to 40% range, but I will tell you that construction projects have continued in full force. Thinking back to March, 20th of 2020, when the pandemic took full force and people started to work from home, the men and women wearing the bright colored vests and hard hats continued to be in downtown Chicago on almost every day. And you may remember that for the first several months of the pandemic, masks, face coverings were the dominant topic of conversation. That started to abate a little bit in May of 2021. And thankfully, with the rollout of vaccines, we started to see a decline in COVID cases. But then the Delta variant raised its ugly head and we saw an uptick in cases. And as a result, we saw mask mandates come back. Now, from a federal standpoint, the CDC issued guidance recommending that all individuals wear masks when they are indoors and when they are in a place of substantial or high transmission. So that meant whether vaccinated or not, the guidelines were wear a face covering when you're indoors in order to be safe. OSHA thereafter adopted that same guidance. So by August 13th of 2021, we had the two main federal watchdogs telling us to be safe, masks should be worn indoors when you are in an area of substantial and high transmission. OSHA also gave us a little preview in August because they announced encouragement for employers to consider adopting mandatory vaccine policies. 
that was a nice preview because OSHA has since spoken on that very topic. The map about where the areas of substantial or high transmission is almost entirely red. I updated this morning, went to the CDC website as of October 13th. There's even more red, which means high transmission areas. So from the standpoint of CDC and OSHA, virtually coast to coast, employees should be wearing masks indoors, regardless of their vaccine status. There are, of course, states and municipalities that have done more than just recommend it. On this slide, you see a list of cities and counties that have a mask mandate. So regardless of vaccine status, if you're in an indoor space, and that includes office settings that are open to multiple employees, then you're required to wear a mask in these cities. But it's not a universal requirement. In states like Maryland or Virginia, there's no statewide directive, but be careful of counties because counties have the authority to announce in their jurisdiction an indoor mask mandate. So in every situation, you wanna be aware what's the federal guidance, what's the state guidance, and is there a local requirement in your county or in your city? If we ignore mask mandates, we take a risk. And there are multiple risks that I see. Number one, you could be running afoul of the local ordinance. And in Chicago and Cook County, for example, that could mean a fine. And repeated violations could literally mean shutting the doors of the business if the employer doesn't enforce a mask mandate. The other risk I see is that since OSHA has announced it believes face coverings should be worn indoors, we run the risk of violating OSHA's general duty clause, which requires us to create a workplace that's free of known hazards. So there's always a risk that OSHA will use the general duty clause to say the workforce wasn't free of known hazards because COVID transmission was present and the employer didn't take all reasonable steps to reduce the spread of the disease. And then of course, the third, the biggest risk, God forbid there be a serious long-term illness or even a death due to COVID, then the employer's practices will be looked at very closely by lawyers, by agencies, by judges and juries. And if you haven't taken all reasonable steps to protect the employees, you could be open to a claim for negligence. Now, here's an interesting caveat. In this world, workers' compensation coverage could actually be beneficial because in most states, if a worker contracts COVID at work or connected to their work, then the workers' compensation insurance and program will likely cover the expenses for illness and lost time. And in exchange under a workers' comp statute for no fault is also the inability to bring a negligence suit. So if you have an employee whose COVID is traceable to their work or their workplace, note that workers' compensation coverage may apply and that may actually reduce the risk of a lawsuit for negligence. So let's stick with OSHA for a few more minutes. It is the federal agency charged with workplace safety. Are OSHA inspections likely in your workplace? Well, yes for a small group of employers and industries. OSHA's National Emphasis Program, which came out on July 7th of this summer, lists a series of industries who are going to be subject to programmed inspections. Right now, that list includes healthcare, meat processing, restaurants. It does not include construction sites. But you'll want to note that website, and we'll want to stay abreast of what OSHA is announcing in terms of the industries it's paying close attention to. There's also a risk of an OSHA inspection if an employee complains. Employees are more familiar than ever with how to contact OSHA through their website or their toll-free number. And if an employee feels generally unsafe in the workplace, an OSHA complaint could trigger an inspection. One example in the news just 10 days ago was an insurance agency in Denver where sadly an individual died from COVID, but another employee reported a concern. 
that the office environment was not requiring masks, was not socially distancing, and didn't stop people who were sick or symptomatic from coming to work. OSHA announced a proposed fine of almost $25,000, and this company is now embroiled in OSHA litigation. So whether an inspection is likely or not, taking the steps to reduce the transmission of the disease just makes good business sense. I will note that OSHA inspections may actually increase if and when OSHA announces its emergency temporary standard requiring vaccinations for all employees of companies with 100 or more employees. And we'll come back to that, Mike, in a few minutes because that's a pretty big topic. Absolutely, and uh, it's a great tease also. For those thinking about signing off right now, they're less likely to do that knowing that we're gonna talk about where we are likely to be going with that emergency temporary standard that should be coming out any day now uh, by OSHA. Um, but before we talk about where we are likely to be going, let's talk about where we have been and where we are now when it comes to vaccines and in particular mandatory vaccine policies. You know, early on, there was really a lot of reluctance on the part of companies to require uh, vaccines. Uh, remember, no two organizations, no two workplaces uh, are exactly the same. And so you should not be doing or thinking about what to do with your organization simply because you may be allowed to do it, or even because other organizations, maybe even in the same industry, are doing it. You really need to focus on what is your organization? What is your workplace and workforce? And what are the different roles within your organization? And how will a mandatory vaccine policy impact all of that? Why were organizations reluctant early on to mandate vaccines? There were a bunch of reasons. Companies have been worried about the impact on morale. If you have 90% of your employees who have already been vaccinated, a mandatory vaccine policy is not going to really push the buttons of a large percentage of your workforce. On the other hand, if you've got 10 or 15% of your employees only vaccinated with the rest of your workplace refusing to or reluctant to be vaccinated, mandating a vaccine uh, might cause a little bit of a stir and, and might impact morale. Worse than that, perhaps, as you are continuing to try to recruit great talent and in fact retain great talent. And we have all seen and heard the news where there are labor shortages in so many industries uh, in so many areas around the country. It may be difficult to recruit and retain your top talent, some employers opined, if they were to adopt a mandatory vaccine policy. Other reasons, employers just did not wanna go through dealing with accommodations and the required accommodation process that we're gonna talk about in a couple of minutes. Employers also were concerned that for a long period of time, the vaccines were only approved for emergency use under what's called the EUA, emergency use authorization process. And they were concerned about mandating a vaccine that had not yet been fully approved by the FDA. As we got to this past summer, however, the numbers have been ticking up and we continue to see more and more employers across all industries and of all sizes starting to require, starting to mandate vaccine policies. What does mandate even mean? There are all different uses of the term mandate. There are many states out there that have no particular requirement, at least at the government level, the state government level, there are some states like Wisconsin, for example, that are specifically uh, offering incentive, uh, incentivization for uh, people to get vaccines. There are some states that have mandatory requirements, but for particular industries like healthcare workers and government employees. Others have what we refer to as soft mandates, which allow the choice. You either get vaccinated or you have to undergo regular COVID testing, either weekly or biweekly. Uh, California, New York are a couple of states that have gone the route of soft mandates. Some employers are requiring vaccinations for certain positions or for certain circumstances, like those who are returning to the office, who are traveling as part of uh, their business duties, 
or who are meeting with customers or the general public as part of their job duties. And again, no one size fits all here. It's really critical that you give some thought to the nature of your organization, the nature of your workforce and the roles at your company to decide whether a mandatory policy is right for you. Uh, and if it is, what type of mandates we are gonna have. Again, putting aside what the federal government and specifically OSHA may be dictating to certain employers of 100 or more employees soon. But again, that's just the latest tease. We will get back to that. To this fundamental question, can employers mandate vaccines? The answer has been fairly simple, at least on paper. Uh, and the EEOC, the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is the federal government agency that deals with issues of harassment, discrimination, and disability discrimination and accommodation, the EEOC has come out and said, yes, employers can, for purposes of their workplace laws, can require that employees be vaccinated in order to physically enter the workplace or even as a condition of continued employment, subject to two very important concepts. That an employee who needs to be accommodated because of a disability or medical condition or pregnancy, or an employee who has a sincerely held religious belief or practice, in those cases, you have to go through a reasonable accommodation process that we're gonna talk about in just a couple of minutes. But subject to those requirements that you reasonably accommodate disability, medical conditions, and sincerely held religious beliefs and practices, employers have been able to mandate vaccines. Again, the question is, do you want to, and is it right for your organization? So when we're looking at this trend, this trend of seeing more employers, in fact, implementing mandatory vaccine policies, there are certain explanations for that trend. In the first of its kind lawsuit at the beginning of the summer in June, a group of employees at the Methodist Hospital in Houston decided to sue their employer claiming that, hey, we should not be required to get a vaccine that is only approved under this EUA emergency use approval process that is not even something that has received full approval by the FDA. That judge rejected those arguments out of hand, um, which has now led to really a, a groundswell of cases and judges that have for the most part up, um, upheld mandatory vaccine policies. You have probably seen around the country some cases where they're dealing with the religious exemption and whether a mandatory policy by an employer or by the government can eliminate the, uh, the obligation to accommodate for certain reasons. But when you're looking at this underlying question of can you mandate vaccines, the cases that have been uh, receiving decisions by judges so far as of October 14, 2021, have overwhelmingly upheld this notion of mandatory vaccines. In July, the Department of Justice issued guidance specifically saying that, hey, yes, employers, the fact that um, these vaccines did not yet receive full and final approval by the FDA, that does not trump your ability as an employer to mandate vaccines. And then still later that month in July, Indiana University uh, was hit with a lawsuit by employees and faculty on this same issue. And the judge there, the trial court judge, as well as the Court of Appeals, uh, a couple of weeks after that in August, continued this trend of upholding mandatory vaccines. Finally, right before um, Labor Day on August 23rd, 2021, the United States FDA granted full approval to Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine. And that was really what triggered this uh, significant trend and uptick in employers going with mandatory vaccine policies. As I said, lots of lawsuits have come up also overwhelmingly supporting the mandate. What else have we seen when it comes to this mandate? It's not just about private employers, 
but the government is getting into the business of mandating for federal contractors. Jeremy, tell us a little about that. Will do, Mike. Yeah, I think those court decisions gave the Biden administration a little more confidence to say, from the federal government standpoint, we're comfortable mandating vaccines. So set aside that choice conversation we just had. And Mike pointed out good reasons why an employer might choose not to mandate the vaccine. If you're a federal contractor, no more choice. President Biden announced on September 9th by executive order that those companies who do business with the federal government must put in a mandatory vaccine policy. It will apply to employees who work for the federal government. It will apply to any workers who come onto federal property to perform work. And now it will apply to the employees of every company who is a contractor or a subcontractor with the federal government. And importantly, in this scenario, President Biden has taken away the testing option. So the mandate is your workers must be vaccinated, not your workers can choose whether to be vaccinated or weekly testing. No, there is no testing choice option under the president's executive order. So starting tomorrow, October 15th, federal contracts that are new or are extended or renewed will contain language that mandates vaccine for all employees who are covered by or work on that contract. Now, there are some contracts not covered, uh, contracts for products, but you can see on this slide a list of the contracts that will be covered or contract-like instruments. It will include construction contracts, contracts to perform services for the federal government or to act with respect to a, a lease or a tenant that is the federal government. So these agencies will be telling you about their mandatory vaccine policy, but note any agency of the federal government could do it. The executive order encourages all contracting agencies to adopt the mandate, not just those who are covered by the bullet points we just looked at. So you could see from your federal government agency a requirement that you have a mandatory vaccine policy, even if you're a products contract, even if you're under the $250,000 threshold, because the president has encouraged all agencies to do this. So September 24th was the second important day of last month when the Safer Federal Workforce Task Force issued its guidelines telling contractors exactly who's covered, how they're covered, and by when they have to act. And those task force guidelines said by December 8th of this year, all, all covered employees of federal contractors must be fully vaccinated. A covered contractor is both a prime and a sub. A covered contractor employee means any full-time or part-time employee who works on that contract or in connection with that contract or at a covered contractor working place. So note the ors in that definition, that increases the types of things that are covered. It means that your employees who are working directly on the contract, fulfilling the service, fulfilling the construction, they need to be vaccinated. It also means the back office people who support that contract, like human resources and billing and accounting, they have to be vaccinated. And the final or means even employees who don't work on that contract, if they work in the same office with employees who do, they need to be vaccinated as well. Just about the only exception would be an employee who works totally remote, doesn't work in connection with any federal contract or subcontract, and doesn't come into the office to be around people who do. So this is a pretty broad coverage mandate. I want you to walk away with three takeaways about the federal contractor mandate. And that is number one, here we go, the slide is dissolving in. Got it, thanks Mike. N number one, all covered contractor employees need to be vaccinated by December 8th. That means fully vaccinated, two weeks past your second dose or two weeks past your first dose of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. So Thanksgiving becomes a very important date for meeting the December 8th deadline. 
Second, compliance is also required with the masking and social distancing requirements of the CDC. So don't forget about those. And then third, a contractor has to designate a person, a man or a woman at the contractor who will coordinate all these safety efforts and the vaccine mandate. Now, in the first one that I talked about, there is an exception. Contractors will be able to provide accommodations for those who have a valid medical or sincerely held religious belief that opposes or makes them not able to get the vaccine. The task force guidance says, you, the contractor, are responsible for receiving those accommodation requests and evaluating them and then putting the appropriate reasonable accommodations in place. So that might mean if an individual has a valid medical reason or sincerely held religious belief that testing rather than vaccination will be a reasonable accommodation. So when I said testing is not a choice under the federal contract mandate, that's true, but it could still emerge as an accommodation for those employees who have a valid medical or sincerely held religious belief. So when you announce the vaccine mandate, make sure to provide for those possible accommodations and consider that testing along with other remedial measures might be an appropriate accommodation. Next slide, Mike. So with respect to federal contractors who have unionized employees, and with respect to any employer that has unionized employees, it's important to understand that imposing a mandatory vaccine policy carries with it a bargaining obligation, an obligation to bargain with the unions. And understandably, some unions have pushed back on behalf of their members to mandatory vaccine policies. Here on the slide, there are a couple of notes about a Teamsters local in Chicago that sued the Teamsters pension fund as an employer saying they could not mandate the vaccine. Those cases will continue to percolate, but the point I wanna make is, if the employer mandates the vaccine, it has an obligation to bargain. And those bargaining obligations come in two flavors. There's the decisional bargaining obligation, meaning you have to talk to the union about the decision to mandate a vaccine. And then there's the effects bargaining obligation meaning you have to talk to the union about the effects of your decision or the consequences or the impact of the decision that you've made. Which one will you face? Well, it depends. You may have, an employer may have a decisional bargaining obligation unless the collective bargaining agreement gives the employer the authority to act unilaterally. And some collective bargaining agreements do that. They may have language that says the employer has the right to make and enforce rules protecting the health and safety of the workforce. That may or may not be broad enough to cover a decision to mandate a vaccine policy. The current standard used by the National Labor Relations Board is whether that language in the contract reasonably covers what the employer is trying to do. So if that collective bargaining agreement says the right to make safety rules, enforce safety rules to protect the health and safety of the workers, then it likely covers the employer's decision to mandate the vaccines. But beware, that hasn't always been the rule and it may not be the rule in the future. The current NLRB chair, Lauren McFerrin, believes that the proper standard is, did the union waive the right to bargain in the collective bargaining agreement? If there's not language saying the union waives its right to bargain over future mandatory policies, then the company is required to bargain. So right now, the law is somewhat favorable to employers who want to mandate a vaccine, but that could change. And regardless of whether the contract gives you the right to unilaterally make the decision, there's also an exception for emergency circumstances. And at the beginning of the pandemic, I would argue those existed. Immediate action was needed to protect the health and safety of workers. But now that we're a year and a half into it, I would suggest a little more caution in relying on the idea that we have to mandate a vaccine because there are emergency and urgent conditions in the workplace that allow us to do so without bargaining. As you think ahead to future bargaining contracts, this might be a topic for negotiations making sure the employer does have some flexibility to act 
in urgent or exigent circumstances. Okay, we'll move past the idea of decisional bargaining without. So you have to sit down with the union that represents your employees and say, here are the topics, the impacts, the consequences. And there will be a robust debate and it varies based on region in the country, leadership of the labor union, feeling of the members. But in my experience over the last six months, these are the topics we have bargained about. How much lead time before the vaccine policy goes into effect? What if a person doesn't have a valid medical or sincerely held religious belief, but they're just adamantly opposed based on personal choice? Will the employer recognize those exceptions? And then is testing going to be an option in lieu of vaccine? Mm -hmm. And if testing is an option, who pays for it? Where do you get it? Is it paid time while you're getting the test? What happens if you miss work because of a positive? And what if a rapid response test has a false positive that's later negated by a more robust PCR test? These are the topics that should be discussed during effects bargaining. A final few topics that I have seen come up in my experience are paid time off if you test positive, switching jobs so that you reduce the chance of people needing to quarantine because they were exposed, or what about severance pay? What if an individual refuses to get vaccinated? Will there be some kind of transition assistance for that person when they leave the job? And what about recall rights? What if a person changes their mind? Or what if the circumstances change? If they decide to get vaccinated, will they have a recall right, either to their old position or to an open position? These are all the topics of conversation that I have seen in effects bargaining. And I would suggest to you that will arise in a number of circumstances. So uh, beyond the union context, uh, as we've been saying now a couple of times, uh, the answer to this fundamental question, are you as an employer allowed to mandate vaccines? The answer is yes. Again, not without some caveats. As we've said already, the EEOC still obligates employers to reasonably accommodate those who can't or shouldn't be vaccinated because of a medical or disability related condition or because of a sincerely held religious belief. The exception to that exception is if providing an accommodation for those two bases would pose an undue hardship on the operation of the business or if it would pose a direct threat to that particular employee or others. There is no exhaustive list of the type of accommodations that an employer might have to give if it's a situation that triggers a need for an accommodation. On the slide here are just some examples of reasonable accommodations who do not or cannot get a vaccine. Uh, it could include, for example, allowing unvaccinated employees to still enter the workplace but wear masks, work at a social distance uh, from other coworkers, other individuals, perhaps work in a different location, a different area on the premises, uh, also get periodic testing and, and be required to provide negative tests weekly or biweekly or in some other period of time, um, or depending on the role, be given an opportunity to telework or to continue to telework. It's gonna be very interesting as we see cases start to come about over the next few months and probably the next few years on this notion of telework. Most employers, maybe not most, but many employers historically have been reluctant to allow employees to telework for a variety of reasons. It's much harder to control what they're doing, to observe what they're doing. There's obviously less collaboration, teamwork, the ability to supervise, all of that is impacted when employees are working remotely and at home. But here's the reality. For the past 18 months, or for some good portion of that, most if not all employees have been working remotely. And in many cases, companies have been saying, either in writing or orally, you know, we've been doing a pretty good job with remote work. We've been productive. We've been able to make our numbers, maybe not as perfect or as well as we used to and could still if we were all in person, but we've been doing pretty well. 
the problem will be when employees want to continue to telework, either because they're entitled to a reasonable accommodation by law or because that's simply their preference. It will be much harder for employers to justify a reluctance to allow them to continue to telework when you have said in many cases over the past 18 months, you have been productive or you have been just as productive working remotely. So before you simply uh, say no to or reject a request to work from home or continue to work from home, it's really important uh, in conjunction with your counsel to analyze the particular situation, the particular request being made um, before being very trigger happy and knee jerk in your reaction to those types of requests. So let's talk about the accommodation process for both of these types of reasonable accommodations. The first one uh, is related to the disability or medical condition that one may have that might prompt a need to uh, be accommodated from a mandatory vaccine policy. Again, no one size fits all, and this very much is an individualized uh, circumstance by circumstance analysis, but here are your general steps. You certainly want to determine whether the employee has made a request for an accommodation, although it's always great to have those things in writing and preferable to get them in writing so that you have a full understanding and you're completely aligned with what you are being asked to do. It is not an absolute necessity in all cases that the request be made in writing. You could be put on notice of a need for an accommodation simply by an oral request or an oral statement being made by an employee. And oh, by the way, email and text and other electronic communications count as well if you are put on notice of this need for an accommodation. They also don't have to specifically use the word accommodation. They don't have to say, I need an accommodation. They have to be giving you sufficient facts, sufficient information, so that it is obvious to you that there is some need, that they do need some uh, accommodation or some exemption from your mandatory vaccine policy. You want to recognize who it is from the requests, from the statements that you're on notice of, that are seeking an accommodation from your vaccine policy. You wanna determine whether the individual does have a covered medical condition and without getting too much into the legal jargon and the weeds here, it is typically from a federal standpoint, one who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, someone who has a record of having such an impairment or someone who is regarded as having such an impairment, even if they don't necessarily have such an impairment. And it's very difficult and quite risky for you to play doctor if you do not have a medical or related degree. So in many cases, employers either have third party administrators or have their own committees with people who do have medical licenses and backgrounds making these threshold <coughs> decisions. In many other cases, employers are not passing go, not collecting $200. They're going past this initial threshold question and just going to, well, can I accommodate this individual? In other words, accepting this threshold, I need an accommodation for a disability related reason. If the particular impairment or the need for accommodation that's being raised is not obvious on its face, you are then entitled to ask for reasonable documentation to establish, in fact, the need for an accommodation from your mandatory vaccine policy. At that point, you're going to engage in what is commonly referred to as the interactive process. It is not you saying you cannot do this or we cannot provide this. Similarly, it is also not about the employee requesting one accommodation and you being required to grant the one and only request that they are making. The interactive process requires you to have a dialogue with that employee to talk about what are the different options, what accommodations are there that might be both reasonable and effective to allow the individual to still do his or her job, the essential functions of his or her job without having to be vaccinated. Depending on the outcome of that interactive process, you should then be prepared to prepare a response to requests for accommodation and certainly circle back with employees.
some best practices here. Some of these have, uh, are self-explanatory. Some of these are a little bit repetitive. Um, you wanna make sure that you do have a policy and procedure for handling accommodation requests. Is it gonna be by your HR department? Is it gonna be by a committee, a single person? Do you have a third party committee or third party administrator who is gonna handle these? I can tell you if you have already not received accommodation requests, you will be getting accommodation requests in the weeks, months, and maybe even years to come. Engage fully in this interactive process. There may be a dispute and we can never tell you that you will never have an employee who brings a claim or files a lawsuit alleging that you failed to accommodate them when they were entitled to one. But at least you will be able to better defend yourself and perhaps reduce your exposure to any of those claims if you can show, and again, ideally through documentation, that you engaged fully in an interactive process on an individualized basis without just making assumptions and presumptions and without paying short shrift to uh, a request for an accommodation. Go through the process, evaluate alternatives. This is so critical because you often have such tension between the business folks who are running to the HR and the in-house legal and saying, we need this person here. We need them to do their job. This accommodation is not something that is helpful to our business, while at the same time, the HR folks and the legal folks are saying, hey, federal law, state law, local law require us to go through this process before accepting or, if appropriate, rejecting a reasonable accommodation request. And the last bullet point is so critical that, of course, it makes sense I put it last, Ensure that your managers and your supervisors know what to do with these things. It's easy to have these presentations. It's easy to have training of your C-suite executives, your HR professionals. They'll know what to do and what not to do. But the people who are on the front lines, who are in the trenches day to day, getting the first line of communication, whether in person or by email, from an employee who needs an accommodation, they should either know what to say, what not to say, or better yet, know the person or the persons to whom this accommodation request should be directed. <clears throat> Let's talk about uh, religious exemptions as well, because uh, this aspect, this type of accommodation is something that employers are seeing in such greater numbers now than even before. Before the pandemic, organizations were getting disability related requests for accommodation. Very few were dealing with this religious belief accommodation. Maybe when it came to, for example, scheduling on the Sabbath or some other types of issues, but we're seeing employers faced with religious based requests for accommodation in growing numbers. And in many cases, we're seeing employees and groups of employees, and I don't mean to, for this to sound negative or disparaging, but in many cases, going on the internet and seeing what organizations and what uh, information is out there from organizations who are not necessarily religious based, but are um, promoting and discussing principles that are not pro-vaccine. And, em and employees are coming to their employer with copies of letters and with statements that they have gotten from the internet. While it's critical to distinguish purely personal, philosophical, and moral objections to the vaccine, which are not necessarily protected by law, from religious-based beliefs and practices which are protected by federal, state, and local law, the question for your organization is, do you want to be in that business? Do you want to be in the business of figuring out this threshold question? Is the objection based on a religious belief or practice? Some organizations are doing that. And when it's not so clear, they are requiring and requesting documentation from clergy, other spiritual leaders, having follow-up discussions with the employees to get a better sense of whether their objection is grounded in religion. Some organizations, again, are going past this threshold question and going straight to the accommodation question. 
Here on the slide, just to give you a little bit of background in terms of what factors are looked at to determine whether someone has a sincerely held religious belief. Courts, when it gets to the court, will look at factors such as, does the belief that the employee is espousing address fundamental and ultimate questions having to do with deep and imponderable matters? Are they comprehensive in nature? And are they accompanied by certain formal and external signs? Are they consistent with how you've seen the employee acting and speaking even before the mandatory vaccine policy came into place? Because again, and it may be a very fine line in many cases, someone who does hold a sincere opposition or objection to being vaccinated that is not rooted in a religious belief or practice is not somebody who is protected by law. So like I gave you some general steps when dealing with disability related accommodations, there are some general practice, uh, best practices for how to evaluate uh, and deal with requests for accommodations under this religious prong. First, you certainly want to evaluate the request to make sure that it does seem to be religious in nature. You want to make sure, again, your frontline managers and supervisors understand the do's and don'ts, and perhaps more importantly, understand to whom these requests need to go to. Like with the disability discussion, there has to be an interactive process. There has to be a dialogue not only about this threshold question about religion, but if you have assumed and accepted that this is religious based, or if in fact it is religious based, can there be an accommodation that is reasonable and effective given the nature of the job, the nature of the job duties and any potential undue hardship? You're going to want to determine if additional information is reasonably needed to evaluate the request not in all cases. I would say in many cases, there will be a justification to, to require an additional dialogue on this threshold question or a request for documentation, but not in all cases. And on this slide, there are four factors that the EEOC has identified where it may not be so clear in the employer's mind that this is a sincerely held religious belief. And here are some of the factors to look at in making that decision. Lastly, again, as I said, when you're going through this interactive process, as you do for the disability related accommodation requests, you wanna determine if there is a reasonable accommodation, one that is effective and allows the employee to still perform his or her essential job functions, provided that the accommodation does not create an undue hardship. And critical to that, it is not just a matter of well, this is annoying to us, or this is going to be a minor cost to us, or what are the other employees, the coworkers going to think if we allow this accommodation? Those are typically not sufficient to claim undue hardship. If at the end of the day, you have gone through this process and you have determined that there is no reasonable accommodation that exists, nothing that would be effective to allow this individual to do his or her essential functions of the job. And assuming there are no other obligations unique to your particular state or local jurisdiction, you may be within your right to say, hey, if you don't get vaccinated, you may be terminated. Ensure that you have appropriate documentation, both of the process that you have engaged in, as well as your ultimate decision so that you have contemporaneous real-time proof that you have at least met your obligations in good faith if they are ever challenged. So that's where we are now. That's where we have been. In the last 10 minutes or so of this presentation, we're gonna start talking a little bit about what's on the horizon. And I know Jeremy, you've teased this ETS issue. Uh, and what OSHA may be doing soon. Why don't you uh, start to take us home here? Oh, I would love to. I think we are headed toward a major confrontation about mandating vaccines. On September 9th, I already told you that President Biden directed the task force to issue guidelines for federal contractors. In that same executive order, 
he directed OSHA to issue an emergency temporary standard that would require every company, regardless of who you do business with, that has 100 or more employees to mandate either vaccination or testing of all its employees. Well, OSHA took that direction to heart. And on Monday of this week, OSHA told us that they have sent a draft emergency temporary standard to the White House for review. Now that's a typical part of the process. The agency sends its draft to the Office of Management and Budget, Budget and the OIRA, which is a sub-agency for review. Typically, OMB and OIRA could take as long as six months to review a proposed rule. That's not expected here. In fact, some very smart people in the legal profession are expecting that OMB may approve and release the OSHA ETS within a matter of days. In other words, it could be before Halloween that we see an announcement that OSHA now requires all employers who have 100 or more employees to mandate the vaccine or mandate regular testing for those employees who are not vaccinated. When that comes out, that OSHA ETS, it will have immediate effect, but it will likely have a grace period for that vaccine or testing regimen to be in place, but it won't be long. Those same very smart prognosticators are predicting it may be as early as December 1st that all employers in the country who have 100 or more employees are required to mandate the vaccine or mandate the weekly testing. December 1st, that's just around the corner. So we're watching very closely to see what comes out of the White House. Now in this particular, in the OSHA ETS, it's clear that testing in lieu of vaccine is going to be an option, but that raises a whole lot of questions about where is the testing done and who pays for it and how often is the testing required and do you have to get tested on a day that you don't work? A flood of questions that we just don't know the answers to. We expect OSHA will have in the ETS guidelines about how this testing and vaccination requirement will follow. We expect to see OSHA say whether paid time off is required to get the vaccine or take the test or recover from side effects or a positive test quarantine. All that could be coming in as little as two weeks. Now, the reason I say, Mike, that we're headed for a confrontation is that it has already been announced that any number of state attorneys general and trade associations are likely to sue to enjoin the OSHA emergency temporary standard. So there's no certainty that it will be enjoined or that it will survive. That's an open question that very bright legal minds are pondering right now. In the meantime, though, I think that the employer who waits and doesn't at least find out how many and which of its employees are vaccinated is really taking a risk by waiting too long to gather that information because that's going to be the step needed before you comply with the OSHA law, whatever it may be. Yeah, and uh, those same bright legal minds are also wondering whether OSHA and even the Biden administration generally uh, expect the ETS to ultimately survive. Because if you look at what prompted this, as you said, on September 9th, uh, President Biden believes that there are not enough people who are vaccinated out there. And President Biden believes that there are not enough organizations who are requiring that employees get vaccinated. So if nothing else, I think the intent and probably the hope of the Biden administration has been, hey, while we have been threatening that this ETS is going to be coming out, and even before it actually comes out, we think that there will be a lot of employees who go get vaccinated. There will be a lot more employers who will start mandating vaccines on their own. And I think the numbers have uh, certainly supported that. As you also said, we are going to be getting lots of challenges. Uh, most of those challenges, I think, will be rooted on this notion of, hey, does OSHA even have jurisdiction or authority 
to do what it's doing. In order to issue an emergency temporary standard as a result, as, a, as opposed to a non-emergency one, uh, there has to be a grave danger. And the ETS that you are issuing has to be necessary to address that grave danger. Well, OSHA, you will all remember, came out in June with an emergency standard that applied only to the healthcare industry. If there was no grave danger to all other workplaces in June, why is there now a grave danger requiring an ETS here in October? Why is it necessary when the prior ETS that was issued for the healthcare industry in June did not have a vaccine mandate? Why is it all of a sudden now necessary that there be one? There's also, I think, going to be some challenges to this 100 employee threshold. Why is there a grave danger that is necessary to be addressed if you have 102 employees, but not if you have 98 employees? Where is this number coming from? And depending on what the substance of the ETS is, and you gave uh, some great examples, maybe paid time off, does OSHA have jurisdiction to issue rules and requirements when it comes to paid time off for federal uh, employers? Uh, there's going to be a lot of <clears throat> legal impact when this ETS comes. There will be immediate lawsuits being filed by individual and separate businesses, by trade associations, industry groups, as well as uh, government entities. Um, and the real practical impact of this, if you are a business with more than 100 employees, are you likely to lose a good number of employees who don't want to get vaccinated, so they'll go down the road and get a job at the 90 employee company that may not be subject to the new OSHA ETS. So there is a lot that we don't know, but as Jeremy said, we are a lot closer to finding out what this is all going to be about because we do expect sooner than later, and I will be surprised if it is not by next week, we will get this ETS issued. What should employers be thinking about doing now? Think about your planning. Think about, are you going to be subject to this ETS if it in fact keeps to this 100 employee threshold? And even if you are not, what do you wanna do or continue to do as we finish off the last quarter of 2021 and move into a new calendar year? What do you wanna do with regard to your workforce? Should you be arranging for vaccination and testing centers offsite or in-house capabilities if you have it to reduce the cost if in fact this is going to be an employer-borne cost? Update your leave policies for vaccination-related issues and those who suffer from side effects from the vaccine. Again, we've been talking a lot as if this were just a federal issue Depending on where your organization is based or where you have employees, there are a lot of state and local requirements and mandates uh, that are popping up all the time. Just this week in Texas, we've seen an executive order which appears to bar private employers from mandating vaccines. Or if they do, they not only have to exempt for disability and religious base reasons, but also if an employee objects to, an, uh, to a vaccine, on their own personal conscience, something that we have not seen as an exemption on the federal level. Update your policies and your procedures and your training when it comes to dealing with the accommodation process and disability and religious objections. Review and revise your COVID-19 safety plans. And if you don't have one, and if you haven't been required to implement one, think about implementing them now as you continue to bring back employees into the workplace, and certainly review your state and local laws to make sure you are in compliance with all of the rules of the road. There are many on such issues as compensability for time that employees are taking to get tested and for the costs of those tests themselves. There are states like Illinois, where Jeremy is, California, that has very strict reimbursement requirements for business related expenses. We are at exactly one hour here. We very much appreciate your time. From my standpoint, if you have not gotten tired of hearing my voice, my shameless plug of the day is that I have created and I host a podcast called Employment Law Now, available on iTunes 
anywhere you get your podcasts, as well as employmentlawnow.com, where I talk about all legal developments in the labor and employment world. And you can be sure I will be updating you right away when that new OSHA ETS gets issued. Employment Law Now. Jeremy, any parting words? You know, Mike, thank you. I think there are a few questions in the Q&A box that I'd like to address quickly, knowing that those people can stay on to hear the answer, as can others. And then Steve will address a question I've seen a couple of times about providing a copy of the PowerPoint slides afterwards. Thank you. Mike and I are both very flattered by that request. And yes, we put a fair amount of time and thought into the slides, so we think they are helpful. First question, any suggestions to verify vaccination credentials from employees who may seek fraudulent credentials? I would say to that question, there's a reasonable review standard. In other words, does the document appear reasonable to the average ordinary person? The government doesn't expect you to be forensic examiners, either in the I-9 space when it comes to authorization documents or in the vaccine space. So view it with an eye toward, does it look reasonable on its face? You can supplement that by having the employee sign a certification saying, I have provided you valid proof of my vaccine status. And then of course, later discovering that was false would be grounds for termination. Another critical point there as well, if you are doing anything other than just eyeballing or even checking off whether someone has shown you proof of vaccination status, and again, Footnote to that, there are states like Montana and perhaps soon others that will not allow you to even ask for that. So know your jurisdiction. But if you are going to be requesting documentation, proof of vaccine status, and you're allowed to, you got to maintain it separate from your regular personnel files. You have to treat this as if it were confidential medical related information. Great point. Next question. Can you talk about smaller businesses who have less than 100 employees in terms of guidelines and mandates and the OSHA ETS? Yes, if you have less than 100 employees, at this moment, we don't think that the OSHA ETS is going to apply to you, meaning we don't think you'll be mandated to have a vaccine or testing policy. So you as a smaller business, and assuming you're not a federal contractor, you fall into that choice category. As Mike laid out earlier in the presentation, do you want to mandate vaccines for your workplace and all the considerations that go into that, like morale, staffing, resources, administrative? So those are the kinds of questions that you have to ponder. And of course, as experienced labor and employment attorneys, we'd be happy to work through those with you. Next question, can employers make vaccination a condition of employment? Yes for all the reasons we've talked about. In fact, it may be a mandatory condition of employment in some cases. Can the question be asked during the interview process? That's a great question. And I, th the answer in my mind is, it's like any other question during the interview process. The question itself is not a problem. It's what you might hear in response to it. So I advise companies that if they have a mandatory vaccine policy, share that information with applicants so that no one is surprised as they progress through the application process to find out you have that. So share the information. It's, but it's, it's also in the follow-up. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeremy. Uh, I was just no, gonna say, okay. it's, also, it's also in the follow-up to your point, you know, almost to be careful what you wish for when you ask that kind of question. You, you certainly can, again, unless you're in a state or local area where you're prohibited from doing it, which is, is still a, a small number. Um, there's one thing to ask the question about what their vaccination status is. This is quite another thing if they say, I'm not vaccinated, to start asking why. Because if you start asking the why questions, you may be bringing up issues about medical conditions and disability and religion and pregnancy and age and all kinds of other things that if you then choose not to hire that applicant, and it might be for a legitimate reason having to do with the job or the qualifications, you will be susceptible to a claim that the actual reason you didn't bring them on is because of the improper information that you gained by asking even an appropriate question. Thank you. Definitely agree with that. And then the final question, can other non-COVID-19 
vaccines or future vaccines be mandatory? What about COVID booster shots? Oh, that's an excellent question. We don't know. Our, our country has a history of carefully and thoughtfully evaluating public health risks. And in certain cases, yes, vaccines have been made mandatory in school settings, in workplace settings, in healthcare settings. Only time will tell. And hopefully COVID-19 is the last of the infectious diseases that we see. But at this moment, there's just no way to predict what will happen in the future. And certainly we'll be monitoring the science with respect to the booster shots, but there have been no announcements about any mandatory booster shots at this point. Is there anything more frustrating uh, and ironic than a couple of lawyers ending a webinar with an I don't know answer? Um, but that is, <laughs> That is the answer to that question. And it's also, I think, worth noting another critical point. Let's not forget that a lot of the um, acceptable practices that the EEOC has allowed employers to do when it comes to asking for vaccination status, uh, asking for proof of vaccination status, things like that are essentially uh, exceptions themselves from the normal ADA, the normal disability rules that were in existence before the pandemic. And the EEOC relied on the fact that we were dealing with a global pandemic and essentially an emergency situation to allow employers to ask certain kinds of questions with limits, but ask certain kinds of medical and disability and vaccine related questions while we're in the middle of this pandemic. There may very well be time, and I don't know whether that's next month or 10 years from now, where because COVID-19 is no longer a global pandemic or no longer the exigent circumstance that it still is, the EEOC may come back and say, you know what, the things you were allowed to do and say, even with COVID-19, you may no longer be able to do. So it's, it's important not to make assumptions or speculate too much about what the world is gonna be like and what the rules of the road are gonna be like. Hopefully we've given you a little bit of sense of the do's and don'ts as we know them today, October 14th, 2021. And if nothing else, stay abreast of all of the changes here, keep in touch with uh, whatever council you've got a great relationship with, and we're happy to help in that regard. Well done, thanks, Mike. Steve, that